Uh, for those of you who have uh, tender psyches, I'm just going to have to tell you, I, 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 I'm feeling an awful silly streak coming on. I, I, I try to maintain sobriety. As a matter of fact, George Ade uh, once said it very well. He said, uh, in effect, if you want to get ahead, remain sober at all costs, if you can. Now, now, <laughs> I've been listening to the news and watching, and, you know, I, I just feel one of those ridiculous silly streaks coming on. And I'll never forget one time, speaking of silly streaks, I had, I had this, uh, this cousin who, who had a very interesting vocabulary. There's always one kid in the crowd that has a vocabulary that's a little more expanded than all the other kids, and the other kids know that it's expanded and don't quite know what he's talking about, but it sounds great. Well, one day, this cousin got on a kick of calling me... Uh, Oh, what was it? He, 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 first, he hollered it out of the window. I remember the second story window. I'm walking down along the car tracks. We had the streetcar tracks there. And every half hour or so, you'd go down and put a penny on the car tracks. Just, you know, to put a penny on the car tracks. So I'm, yeah, you put a penny on the car tracks. Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> well, what do you mean? Oh, well, now look. Now, now, now just a minute. I, 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 I have a penny that has the Lord's Prayer on it, too. And I have a penny that says, yes, I do. I have a penny that has my fortune on it. It says, I'm a, ri a reliable, sober, industrious person given to momentary rages, which could get in my way. In God we trust. It says on the bottom of one cent. Now, uh, <laughs> I'm down there putting a penny on the car tracks, and my, my cousin Buddy hollers out of, this is Buddy again, he hollers out of the window, he says, hey, what are you doing? I can't remember. Hey, what are you doing, Satchel? The heck was it? It's on the tip of my tongue. Satchel. No, it wasn't Satchmo. It was Satchel. I, I, it's on the tip of my tongue. It says, uh, he says, Hey, what are you doing, Satchel? Hey, do you know what that phrase is this kid used? I don't remember. If there's any, any of you out there remember what it is, it's just please, please, you know, this is... I hate to have something stuck on the end of my tongue without it coming out. This silly streak coming out. Speaking of silly streak, today I'm, I'm reading an editorial that says that in... Uh, I think they were referring to Syria or someplace, and it says, In Syria, once again, the American ambassador has been forced to eat humble pie. And you know, for years, I've been looking for a place here in New York where I can get myself a good slice of humble pie. Uh, no, seriously, humble pie, perhaps those of you who don't know it, humble pie is a Midwestern dish. And uh, if you think I'm kidding, you, yes, it is. Humble pie is a pure Protestant Midwestern angry Puritan dish. And, uh, yes, and it is eaten at certain ceremonial times of the year. And for those of you who have a dictionary, please look up humble pie, will you? And uh, I think it would be great if all of us at one time, on one day, were to all go in, say, places like Needix or, you know, where they have pies, and say, you know, they've got boysenberry pie. This is the only place I've ever been in my life where they have a pie just called berry pie. Berry pie in New York, and they can't tell you what kind of a berry it is. They got blueberries, they got gooseberries, and blueberries. and at the bottom it says berry pie. This happened to me just last Friday, and I said to the woman, "What is a berry?" She says, "It's a berry pie." I said, "But what kind of berry, madam?" It's a brief pause. She says, "Berry, berry, berry, berry pie." I said, "Well, look now, you've got listed right there. You've got gooseberry, you've got boysenberry, and you've got..." Blueberry and you got berry. What what is a berry pie, you New Yorkers? What is a berry pie? You don't just grow a thing called a berry. You don't, you know. You just got a berry, and yet oh look at the New Yorkers. They don't know that that's a nutty thing. Is there anybody know where I can get a good slice of humble pie here? Seriously, look it up. Just look up the, the expression humble pie. It, it fits so many of them. It's just terrible. I I feel a, a strange kind of silliness coming out. In fact. Uh, speaking of silliness, it's getting it's getting completely out of hand. I, 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 I can't remember what it was that Buddy called me, Satchel. Satchel, something. Uh, <laughs> I know that it was very funny, and I, 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 I didn't quite understand the expression. And, and about an hour and a half later, I called my father that. And, uh, <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. Maybe that's why I can't quite remember what it was, you know? I think perhaps that might be it. You know, it's it's it's, it's amazing how your mind, you know, your your mind just blanks it out, just erases like a great big a great big windshield wiper of fate. 
Speaking of the well, oh, I feel silly as all get out. Let's go over the desert wild and free. Rides the bold sheik of Araby and his bearer band at his command. Follow his love's caravan. Oh, I'm the sheik of Araby. You're all oh, hey. Uh, let's, you you want to hear the opening of this thing? It's never sung. The opening has real heart. I mean, it, it's really it it, it, uh, it it describes to you a scene and a world that has long since gone and passed. I wonder. I wonder how much of uh, of movie Moskville still affects the thinking of people about uh, about architecture in this country. No, seriously, you know that I once lived next door to a house that was designed as an offshoot of movie architecture. You can't really call it architecture. You know the kind of the spires and minarets of ancient Araby type movie houses they had. You ever see those houses, Ed? The great big ones. Well, well, they had they had a, uh, a a movie house on 79th Street in Chicago. I will award you the brass figure gee if any of you if any of you ex Chicago types can tell me. And even the name was right out of that whole strange panoply of uh, nuttiness that was uh, that was Rudolph Valentinosville. And this was long after that, see, and I'm a kid, and I'm going to this movie house, and I keep asking my mother, why, why do they have all those, you know, those things up there? And she says, that's a mosque. And, <laughs> mosque, and you're in there watching, watching uh, Priscilla Lane, you know. Well, well they had, they had it, was, it was a movie house that was built, well, it was like the Arabian Nights, you know. It had, it had mosques, it had bells, and every night at 6 o'clock on 79th Street, they would, uh, don't ask me why, I guess it's calling the faithful to prayer. I suppose you're supposed to bend in the direction or kneel in the direction and bow in the direction of Hollywood. I don't know what it was quite, but, but at 6 o'clock, this movie house would have bells that would toll, like calling all of the faithful to pray. Boing! It would go boing! Boing! And, and I, I know that every bank night fan within miles felt a little warmth there, you see. But they had this place, and what was the name of that movie house on 79th Street? It was a great name for a movie house. And, and, and this movie house, when you came in there, oh, I would love to have one of those chairs. Let me tell you, I used to sit down there, uh, and no, no, not the LB, crying out loud. It had a real name. And they had chairs in the lobby that were at least ten and a half feet high, with griffins, and with with crowns carved all over them, and you know, great big claws for for uh, <laughs> for the uh, you know for the armrests, and they had great big claws with the feet on the bottom holding big balls of, of glass, and they, they had teeth, big fangs, and all that stuff. And I'd sit there, you know, with a big goose head shooting out all over me, and I'd sit there and I'd wait for Bruner in one of these chairs. You know, I'd go there 20 minutes early just to sit in the chair, and and they had that, that purple drinking fountain. So what was the name of the theater? Come on. You don't know? Oh, I don't know whether they ever named them like this out here, but uh, Chicago was fantastically influenced by movie, rotten, mosque, uh, riding over the sands of Araby type architecture. It really was. And n right next door to the house where I lived was a house that was designed like one of those places. It had a little mosque on top of it, and it was made out of dark yellow stucco. Pressed stucco, you know, with little prickles all sticking out. And it had twisted iron balconies and balustrades. And this was a two-and-a-half-room cottage, believe it or not. <laughs> Designed to, to have people play guitars at 4 o'clock in the morning. Now, this, this was right out of that period. Listen, over the desert, wild and free, rides the bold Sheik of Araby. At his Arab band, at his command, follow his love's caravan. Under the shadow of the palms, he calls, he sings. Yes, to call her to his arms. While stars are fading in the dawn, over the desert they'll be gone. His captured bride, close by his side, swift as the wind they will ride. Proudly he scorns her smile of fear. Soon he will conquer love by fear. <laughs> Oh, jeez. I'm the sheep of Araby. Your love belongs to me. At night when you're asleep. Come on, baby. Into your tent, I'll creep. Hold it. 
Oh, boy, there's a, there's a true believer. Isn't that a great name for a theater? The Avalon. There was another one that was even worse than that, called simply with, with succinct Chicago directless, The Oriental. And uh, The Oriental, honestly, you felt like you couldn't get in there without a prayer rug. And, uh, oh, yes, it was, it was very, very Oriental, very terrible. That you, you could smell hashish. When you'd come into the lobby there, oh, yes, hashish, double feature day. They'd give away a little package of hashish and peyote, and you'd get into this place. <laughs> I, I don't quite know, I don't know quite know what the, what the point was, but they certainly had it. You know, speaking of, uh, of the, uh, of the problem of the movie world, uh, and the reality or unreality therein and there too, there, there is, I believe that all over the world, the movies, not only the movies, I suppose the movies more than any other art form, if you can call it an art form. But the movies have replaced reality in so many people's lives. Uh, I'll never forget going to, to Amsterdam and seeing long lines of people waiting in line to see Elvis Presley movies. Now, I don't know what in the daylights they saw in an Elvis Presley movie or what possible relationship or, or identification they could have had with Jailhouse Rock. You know, and and, uh, and you should have heard this guy hollering "Jailhouse Rock." It was all translated into Dutch, you know. And I, I went into yes, they were singing it in, in Dutch. And I went into this movie house. I just wanted to see what it was like. And you know, I go to a Dutch movie house with an Elvis Presley movie going, and all these square people sitting around with wooden shoes. And there were some in there with wooden shoes sitting there. And Presley is sort of pouting and simpering around, you know. Well, I may tell you here, baby, and. and you could hear, you see, it was funny, being an American, I could tell what he was saying. Because, you know, you'd be surprised how much lip reading we do without knowing we do it. And there would come the translation on the bottom would be in Dutch. And, and also, they have both written translation and they have a spoken thing. And so he would be saying, come here, baby, and let me, let, let me, just, let me just squeeze you a little old waist. And it <laughs> <laughs> it's a very funny, very funny lip sync. And then all of a sudden, you, you, you can see him. He rears back with his guitar. And that was the only moment that it was in English. It's, uh, the, the songs were in English because they'd heard all these in their jukeboxes. See, they didn't, they didn't have a Dutch uh, Elvis Presley sing it. And so he goes, <laughs> Dutch is a very, very tough language. That's why the Dutch are always very angry people. They, uh, most, you know, it's a very difficult language. In fact, many of the Dutchmen... The Hollanders can't even pronounce the language themselves. Yes, you know that the name of the airport, for, for one, in Holland, is so difficult to pronounce that when the Germans came there, the way they could always tell a German when he was underground, you know, trying to be pretend he was a Dutchman, was the fact that none of them could pronounce the name of the airport. Do you know the name of it? Uh, it goes something like... <coughs> Excuse me, madam. It goes up. Uh, it does. It really does. It goes... Skiffle, skiffle, something like that. And, and uh, you get into the cab, you know, and, and when you want to go to the airport, you go, skiffle, <coughs> All I did was just sort of point up, and I'd get there. Speaking of, uh, speaking of the imponderable, this is WORAM and FM, New York. Well, it was, it was really great. Somehow, you know, the, all the old chauvinism that's inside of every American, you have no idea how great it is to sit in a movie house, and you're the one that can laugh at the end jokes. Really, you know. <laughs> Presley says something in, in English, and of course it's totally unrelated to what is being said to the people in, in Holland. And, and you'd laugh at the end joke. And then suddenly he rears back and goes, I want to walk, I want to walk. And... <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I can't quite feel or understand what the Dutch, what the Dutch relate this to. Now, all over the world, I believe, in, in so many ways, reality has become too difficult for us to understand. Really has. Uh, what with the reality, and that's not just little simple things like space travel and all. It's, 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 the, it's the reality of existence when there are too many people on the same piece of real estate at one time, and the old, all the old values did hell. You know, they they held like fifty, a hundred years ago, the good and evil, and all the rest of these things, and and hardly any of them really are operative anymore. So it's very hard to make any sense of anything. But the movies always make sense. 
there is a beginning, there is a middle, and there's an end. And if it's a happy ending, so much the better. If it's a bad ending, it's an art film. Well, uh, the point being, the point being, you know, that that it's discernible. There's a plot. Well, how's the plot in your life coming, Ed? Is it developing pretty good, or is it? Or are you bogged down in a second second act? Uh, uh, really, it's picked up. For crying out loud, what scene are you in? I mean, you know, all good plays are divided into scenes and acts and all that. I mean, what scene are you in? It's a second scene in the third act. It's beginning to move along there. Well, be careful, you know. I mean, be sure you have a happy ending, you know. And and so so these plays, you know, these these plays, and, and everybody is kind of. In in a way, he's kind of abdicating life for a, a sort of vicarious life. Every place you go, and it's getting to the point now where people really will argue over the vicarious life more than they will argue over real life. You can get people. Believe me, I know on the radio, right? Just just being right here on the air, I can tell you this: if I said something rotten about Kennedy, okay, we'd just lay it out there. See, nothing would happen. Five minutes later, if I said something rotten about Elizabeth Taylor, the switchboard would fly right off the wall, right? Right. And this is a civilized... It's just that way. I mean, it's just absolutely that way. Uh, I can, And even the minor ones. If I said something rotten about Rock Hudson... Oh, believe me. One night, I inadvertently said I did not dig Tony Martin singing. And believe me, people were standing down outside of the station for three days with petitions. Four guys went all the way to Washington to go to the FCC. <laughs> Tony Martin. Well, you know, it's a it's a it's a funny situation. I don't I don't know what it is. Well, do you know the big hassle that's going on in Norway right now? The big hassle. There is a big hassle. Do you have important type music in there, Eddie? Important type music. And now, if you if you play ragtime cowboy Joe. <laughs> I need, I need, all right, all right, you can't find important time music, so I'll just read it cold. You got a whole disc full of it now. Don't sit there and look at me dumbly. That's it. There you go. Give me, give me good, big, important type music. Because there is a gigantic hassle going on, and you'll never guess who it, who it concerns. It's in Norway, and Norway is a very civilized country. Oh, that's it. Oslo, Norway. Donald Duck is one of the most popular cartoon figures in all of Norway, but he has been banned from Oslo's municipal film libraries. Donald is the innocent victim of the ceaseless linguistic dispute, which is a widespread pastime in Norway. Norway is a bilingual country. The majority speak the so-called Reichsmal which, however, is being stripped of its linguistic purity by constant efforts to merge it with the so-called Lansmal. This is based on peasant dialects and is spoken nowhere in the country except in the state radio broadcast. Nevertheless, Lansmal has its determined adherents who are now protesting what they consider the ridiculing of Lansmal in the Donald Duck cartoon series. Donald Duck is speaking Lansmal. <laughs> Have you ever heard Donald Duck? He speaks a pretty difficult brand of English, you know. I can't even... <laughs> the cartoons that brought Donald into disgrace concerned... Listen to this. Concerned a strange country... This was a cartoon sequence in Donald Duck... Where people were said to be square... And the hens were believed to produce square eggs. But these square people incidentally spoke Lansmal. This was too serious to be taken as a joke by the Lansmal Crusaders. Now a library film committee is investigating whether square people do speak Lansmal in real life. <laughs> Is it square people? What do square people speak in here in, the, in our country? I like the idea. They're, they're investigating to see whether square people really do speak Lansmal in real life or whether this is a dismal lie. Well, now they, they're, they're, there is an example of the very thing. You know, speaking of, uh, of, the, uh, of the problems that face us, you have a good English piece in there. I, 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 the, only the English 
uh, among the Western peoples. So far, very few Americans do it. Only the English can draw back, maybe because they've lived so long in one place, rubbing kneecaps to kneecap for so long, riding in bad cars on bad roads, uh, looking at the sea, that the English can look around and see life as a whole. In short, see mankind rather than just me and just you or your own particular navel. Do you have, you have a good English music in there? A recent comment... Oh, my God, there will be an England. Every time there will be an England, we'll fight them for my head rods, we'll threaten the yard. Tonight, the BBC brings you its special medical supplement from the medical journal Lancet, 4 May 1963, page 993. A remark, in fact, a curiously interesting remark by a typical British physician looking at the world in general. English medicine marches on! <laughs> quote tonight from an article by Sir Dr. Theodore Fox, Lancet. Although I saw a great many people in Australia, I was long in seeing a kangaroo. When I did, it was in a station where the kangaroos, or roos as they are called locally, were regarded with a certain affection, but also a certain desperation. Being, I was told, in pest proportions. Ever since then, I have been wondering whether we ourselves are not assuming pest proportions in the British Isles. Spoken like a true British guy. And so our salute to the British medical man of the night goes to Sir Dr. Theodore Fox. Indeed, the British are approaching best proportions. Salute to you for superior insight. By God, sir, you're an Englishman. You know, it's, uh, I, I don't think there's another creature in the world that's nearly as uh, chauvinistic as man. I mean, we really do believe, we, we honestly do believe that we are the supreme creatures and the supreme creations of everything. There's no question about it. Has it ever occurred to you that we could very well be approaching pest proportions in the world? Now, you know, the, the uh, sociologists have been saying this for a long time. In fact, uh, people who deal with world geopolitics have said one of the great problems is what they call the uh, population explosion. That's another way of saying pest proportions. <laughs> the world is getting overrun like an old apartment overrun with cockroaches. And in many ways, we you know, we are very close to the cockroach. Uh, people do believe, yes, uh, uh, it is. It has been established that that a hate is developed. Strange kinds of uh, irrational hates are developed for creatures which resemble the creature that hates most closely. Uh, in other words, man will develop an almost irrational fear of a gorilla, much more so than he will say uh, a rhinoceros. Do you know that men men fear gorillas more than rhinos, and rhinos are fifty times more tough powerful and dangerous. In fact, uh, almost every third or fourth monster horror movie features a gigantic gorilla. I have yet to see one featuring a gigantic rhino. Yeah, really, like a 50-foot tall rhino that gets loose and runs over the Bronx. The hippo that swallowed Staten Island. <laughs> Something. <laughs> but, uh, and, and, and yet, yet we don't, you know, we, the, 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 the gorilla is so much like us that we, we hate him. We fear him and hate him and everything else. You know, people just, just, just hate. And at the same time, you, you, people will, will get a great affection for a gorilla. Like Susie the gorilla, you know. They'll have a great affection for a gorilla and at the same time a great hate and a great fear. Now, this is the thing 
that many, many uh, people have said leads to our fear of the cockroach. The cockroach not physically resembles, although he is pretty oily. Uh, the cockroach does not physically represent us, but he mentally and morally and in other ways is every bit as sneaky as we are. For example, the cockroach is extremely adaptable. Are you aware of that? Just like man. Man can live in the, in the tropics. He can live in the temperate zone. He does pretty good even in the Arctic. And so do cockroaches. Cockroaches make the scene baby everywhere. There, yes, you'll find cockroaches living right in the middle of Nigeria. Cockroaches as big as a tennis racket. At night, you can hear them chewing tobacco, hollering. Oh, it's fantastic. And, and oh, really, as a matter of fact, some tribes in the deep innermost recesses of Nigeria have the great god cockroach. And it's carved out of ebony, and a great big cockroach is sitting up there on top of a totem pole looking down. They figure, you know, they, they might as well, they, they know where the, where, the, where the body's buried, you know. Because, yeah, that's a fact, you know, tribes have come and tribes have gone, but the cockroach remains. So they assume, you know, the only thing that's eternal is God, and what's God? Cockroach. Well, well, the cockroaches are everywhere. Now, now, as you know, if if you've ever had a cockroach, if you've ever, ever well, you don't have a cockroach. Let's face it. How's it? See, that's the way it is with with mankind. There is no such thing as a man anywhere. I mean, the first one you see, if you're living on a desert and you see one man, you can be, you can be, you can be damn sure that within 25 minutes, Howard Johnson's is not far behind. And with Howard Johnson's goes all the rest, and you know what all the rest is. Well, that's just exactly the same thing with a cockroach. One little cockroach sticks his head out from behind the clock, and you know you've had it. You can run over there and swat him. It doesn't make any difference. You can swat that first guy that lands his foot right on this North American continent. You are going to get Ed Sullivan eventually. It doesn't make any difference. And that's the cockroach. I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'll never forget. You know, speaking of cockroaches, I, I, I don't know whether I ever told you the story about the time that the Doppler... See, I, I knew this family that, that uh, it's funny, you don't even recognize poor families when you know them. You know, when you're a kid, there's no such thing as poor. There's just people who live in a great way. You know, the, the kids are allowed to go out and pick up junk and break windows and, uh, you know, <laughs> all that great stuff. Well, well, this kid was in school with me, and little did I realize he was a poor kid. He was, he was the one kid when they had the examination one time. I'll never forget this scene. They had the examination. You know how the school doctor comes? Do they do that here in the East? And you all line up, and he looks in your mouth. Then he looks in your ears. Then he looks in your eyes. You know that, sir, that scene? Then he puts the stethoscope. Well, they looked at Doppler, and they found a large colony growing behind his left ear and just over the top of his eyebrows. Yes, he had strange little beings growing in there now. <laughs> yes, he did. And, uh, you know, he had, like many poor kids, he had a mop of hair. Well, his hair was not lonely hair. And, in fact, it wasn't troubled hair. Day and night, there were parties going on up there. And, and uh, yes, and Doppler, it's a funny thing about Doppler. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm sorry. That's what the way it was. Uh, he had those things growing in there. Well, they spread, too. And it spread through 1A like a shot. And, and about about three days later, I came home, and I will never forget the scene. I came home, and you know, you, 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 some, you know, there is something pleasurable about scratching. You're aware of that. It is fun to scratch. Now, I'll admit it. Now, of course, there's a lot of born girdle wearers out there looking at me with a, with a dirty look. And, and let's face it, there are some things that are fun that we like. Like a good sneeze never hurt anybody. It's not truth. A good sneeze uh, and a good scratch. Uh, I, I enjoy a good scratch. Well, at that point, you know, I'm about, what is it? What are you when you're in 1A or 1B? Yes, a good scratch. Well, I suddenly found that I enjoyed scratching more than I'd ever enjoyed scratching before. And I would sit there at night after supper, you know, reading Raggedy Ann or, or with the radio on or doing homework, and I'm scratching like mad, and I'm enjoying it. And I, whoa, and I get both hands in my hair, you know, going up like this with the hair. I'm scratching and scratching and scratching and, and, and enjoying it. Well, this goes on for about three or four days, and it began to get a little, you know, funny, but I enjoyed it. I just loved the scratch, and I would wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and I'd look up, and it's dark, and, and I would find scratch, and ah, I'd scratch. And then the next morning, I would get up, and of course, you're supposed to comb your hair. I would comb my hair, and you know how it hangs down with the water, drips as a kid, and I would scratch that. Well, let me say, it's all right, Ted, I'll do it. I know they're there. You're just going to have to wait. So I'm scratching and scratching and scratching. 
And then one night, my mother said, What is, what is, will you quit the scratching? Will you cut out the itching? Come here, let me look at you. Well, she pulled me over under the lamp and looked at me, and you should have heard that scene. You know, I had never heard of these things before in my life. I had, because that just was totally, totally alien to our world. She says, look, oh, no. She says, she says, come here, Randy. She calls my brother over, and she takes him and puts the light on, and she looks through his hair, and she says, oh, no, no, both of you. Oh, no, 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 no. No, she says, come on in the bathroom quick. Well, she takes us into the bathroom, and she pours hot water over our head, gets vinegar, she gets vinegar, she gets salt, she gets Life Boy soap, she gets Lysol, turpentine, paint thinner, mercurochrome. She's pouring everything on our head and combing and swishing around. And the whole bitch, you know, well, this goes on for about three hours. My head was sore. I didn't know what in the, what was going on. Your head gets, you know, how you'd be surprised how tender your head gets. So my head is sore, and all these things are flying out. Well, then she says, now, now where did you get this? Where did you get this? I'm going to send a note to your teacher. Oh, this is awful. Oh, there is a terrible scene. So she says, I'm going to send a note to your teacher. I said, Mom, no, don't send a note to Miss Shields. No, no, you know, it's a terrible. I'm going to send a note. My kid brother wasn't even in school yet. No, no, no. She said, no, you had to get it in school. And, and, and Miss Shields has got to know about this so that she can stop it because you're just going to get them again. Now, I'm going to send a note to the teacher. Well, the next day, I go to school with this sealed note in an envelope. And she says, I'm going to call up Miss Shields to see whether she got it. Well, you know, this is this has really got her down her on. So I arrive in school. You know, I'm sitting back there. My head is, is, is still sore. It's pink. And she's cut it in the back with a razor. And, and, and yet I still had them scratching. They were still scratching. She was going to take me to see Dr. Slicker about it, you know. He was going to spray me or something. Well, uh, she's, you know, and I was, felt rotten now. But I'm itching. I give Miss, Miss Shields the note. Miss Shields reads this thing and she blenches. It apparently was explaining what was happening to Miss Shields' coiffure. And she blenches. She says, what? And she says, come on now. All right, all right. All, 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 the, all the pupils now stand up. All of you stand up. All the boys first now. Stand up. And I, I, want, I want here, uh, Esther Jane, you, you take charge of the class. All of you boys were going immediately down to the school doctor. Oh, boy, and the kids knew that I had precipitated it. I had, I'll go to my note, you know. So we all go down to the school doctor. We're standing in line, you know, where the scale is, and the kids don't want, and she's talking to the doctor up there, and the doctor's, okay, one after the other. He's going, he's got the little light, you know. He's looking at the kids. He's dividing them into two crews, <laughs> the itchers and the about to itchers, you know. He's put them in the two groups like that, like that. All right, okay, 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 okay. And she points me out. I'm the one, see? Okay, 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 okay. Would you believe it that the rumor got out all through school that Shepard had infested the entire first grade with lice? And I knew who it was. I knew who it was. <laughs> How do you chicken? You can't say it's Doppler. He's got the bugs. We all had the bugs. But that's the way the rumor got out. And my mother went to a bridge party about three days later, and she was out of her skull. Because about nine mothers from my room were there and were talking about the lice, the lice the genie had brought to school. Lice? Oh, jeez. You know, now when I think about lice, well, I've had, you know, there's another, there's another kind of infestation that, that is equally interesting, but that's another story. But Lice was one of the great, fantastic, unbelievable, embarrassing moments that I gave Esther Jane Alberry the Lice. You know, I mean, and here I was trying to make time with her. I was in 1A, you know, and the, and the whole thing was, you know, I was just beginning to read Raggedy Ann and Raggedy Andy with some fluency when I came down with the bugs. <laughs> well, it was all right. I want to tell you what happened. That's okay. Because it wasn't more than six weeks later that Esther Jane got the worms. And I did not have worms. Yeah, and of course, immediately they gave us all an examination for worms, which is very exotic. But nevertheless, she got the worms. And, <laughs> you know, <laughs> oh, yeah, it was terrible, terrible. If you think only beagles have trouble, you should see kids in the Midwest. They really have trouble. <laughs> 
Well, I want to, one thing that did happen with Doppler, though, I'll have to go, you know, the kids have a very close relationship with bugs. And at about the same year, I, I guess I was about uh, probably in, in second grade now, this kid Doppler, who was the poor kid in the neighborhood, Doppler had this house that was just completely loaded with stuff. You know how you'd be, you know, it's, it's funny, uh, uh, the kind of house that's right on the edge of being a raggle taggle gypsy house. You know what I mean, Ed? Where the backyard's full of old bicycle wheels, and there's some kind of a funny shed in the back with wood piled up next to it, and there's chickens looking out from under the porch, you know, that kind of place. And yeah, you know, that, it's, it's a, it has a funny smell. And it's gray. It's all the paint is peeling off, and you get in there, and they have things made out of crates. And down in the basement, it's it's just completely loaded with great big bolts and stuff, and jugs and cans, and and a very funny smell. And nobody works. It smells like oil and stuff in the house. You know that kind of place. Well, Doppler and I developed, I think, one of the greatest hobbies, one of the greatest insane hobbies that I have ever had. You know, I've I've, I've known good hobbies, but this was the most satisfying hobby I've ever had in my life. I recall, now wait a minute, now you wait till after it's over, okay, honey? I can remember this hobby, and I will always remember the hobby because of the repercussions that followed. We used to come home in the afternoon, and Mrs. Doppler did something like take in washing next door or something, and the house would be empty. And, and, and a lot of poor people, are you aware that many poor people fear light? Are you aware of that? Very, no, it's true. Strangely enough, many poor people keep their shades drawn all the time. Maybe to keep the, the outside world out. I don't know what it is. Uh, no, no, it's much more complicated than that. No, a very, very complicated situation. But I've been in many poor places where they keep the shades down. Everything is dark. Well, this is the way. But that was great for us. So we would come into the kitchen. See, and it's absolutely pitch black in there. It's in the afternoon, pitch black. And we would throw on the light. And 87 million cockroaches would be running all over the place. They'd be running in and out. One thing they stayed in was the Big Ben clock. They had one of these big nickel clocks. And I don't know why cockroaches like clocks. Now, this, this is another thing, see, that cockroaches are very similar to us in. They're hung on time. Clocks and cockroaches go together. So the minute we'd, we'd throw the light on, these cockroaches would start running for the clock. They would start running from behind the icebox. They would be running like mad into the cupboards. And, and, and Doppler and I are running around grabbing them. We're grabbing cockroaches as fast as we can grab them and putting them in the ball jars. And then, of course, they would all disappear, and we've got a mess of cockroaches fighting and hollering in the jar. And then we would wait. See, we'd turn the lights on, we'd wait. And then suddenly you would hear the army approaching. You'd hear them, you see. They're carrying away the tin cans. And, 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 and Doppler would be over by the switch, see, and I would be over here by the, by the middle of the table. I'd say, okay, okay, Doctor. All right, you watch the door, Doppler. Okay, and I'll, I'll, I'll guard the cover. Okay, okay, now! Pow! Throw out and... Oh, hey, look at that great big gravel! He's on the... Ooh, pow! And we're grabbing the cockroaches. We had about four pounds of cockroaches, and, and we're keeping them in a jar. Well, see, cockroaches live forever. I hope you know that. You cannot kill a cockroach by putting him in a jar. In fact, he thrives. He gets bigger and fatter and heavier. So by... By, I'd say, oh, by the time we had been doing this for three, and we were putting them under, under Doppler's basement steps. And so by the time we had been doing this, maybe three or four days running, we divided them into two gigantic jars, two big quart ball jars, you know, the green kind? And that was what? So we're, we're dividing the loot. And I says, okay, Doppler, I'm taking mine home. <laughs> Well, I, I, all I have to say is I arrived home and I put my cockroaches. I had a gigantic jar of about four and a half pounds of the biggest, fattest, oiliest, rottenest, sneaking, clickety-clacking cockroaches you ever saw in your life. And, and, my, and you know, I'm taking them out. I'm, once in a while, I take one, runs across the table. I put them in the thing. You know, you don't just, cockroaches are not, are not resting creatures. You know, you play with them. So that night, I have this jar of cockroaches big crawling fat jar of cockroaches I stick it under my bed and the next morning I go to school and it must have been about 10 o'clock in the morning after I'm in school my mother is dusting under the bed and out comes my ball jar she takes one look at that ball jar and from what I understand now all I gotta all I gotta tell you is well all I she went right through the screen door without touching the frame ladies are very nervous about bugs 
And there was a jar of the biggest, fattest, and women, and mothers, there is something connected with morality in cockroaches. Are you aware of that? That if you have cockroaches, you're somehow immoral. It's a very interesting American problem. Well, of course, we had more cockroaches in that one jar than lived in our entire neighborhood. And <laughs> you, shall I tell you how we, finally, how we finally captured the biggest collection of cockroaches? We used to electrocute them. Oh, terrible people, terrible. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I want we took, we took, we took to. We took a cord, an electric cord. And, and yeah, oh, it was an awful thing. I just, I don't want to tell you how this is. It's a great hobby. I want to tell you, if, if any of you got cockroaches, it's a great hobby. We took, we took an electric cord, say, oh, yeah, we, and, and you strip the two ends. You see, you just plug it in. You strip the two ends. And then you, you put about nine pounds of cheese around, see, or something, see, and then in the dark. And suddenly, when the light goes on, all the cockroaches for one minute are there. And then you take the two, the two ends of the thing, and you just shove it into the crowd of cockroaches. <laughs> Boy, they're good conductors, Eddie. They're almost as good as copper number 18 wire, fine drawn. Let's do some commercials here. We got Mandarin House. And if you're going to make the restaurant scene this, oh, I have to do all the cockroach stuff. Oh. Uh, <laughs> let's do the paper book gallery first. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> all right, well, that was false start, Ed. False start. We're doing paper book gallery now. Paper book gallery. Yes, I'll tell you another thing about it. You want to hear more about cockroaches? Do you really? Do you want to hear what you can do with cockroaches on a quiet afternoon when it gets warm and a cockroach begins to trust you? Do you want to know how you can have cockroach races? You know, cockroaches are, are like people, incredibly competitive. Incredibly competitive. That's true. Oh, yes. Do you know that in England, for over 20 years, they had actual cockroach handicaps? People bet, lost, and won money on them. That is the truth. And, and if you'll stay tuned, next week at the same time, we'll give you other sporting hints and kinks. For those who like to do it at home, have fun with the little things. Work with your own hands. Move among the little people. Make real contact with nature itself. <laughs>